everybody. Welcome to Veterans Remember, which is an ongoing documentary created by HCAM TV Studios on Main Street. I'm Hank Alessio, pleased to host this journey to Hopkinton's past. <clears throat> the Veterans Remember segment has a format of one-on-one -on -one conversations with men and women from Hopkinton that have served in the military. You will see and hear about our town's rich heritage, the grassroots experiences of our veterans. You will witness their personal stories, how in their small ways they helped shape the nation, and what the military did to affect their lives. Hundreds of individuals from Hopkinton have served in the military, some with a lot of valor. Recorded conversations compiled thus far included persons young and old from all branches of the military and who served in just about every corner of the world. Some of our guests served in combat zones and many served during peacetime. We hope you will enjoy seeing family members, your neighbors, or Hopkinton residents you've heard of but never met. You'd be surprised at who has worn a military uniform. Every guest before your very eyes offers a footnote of history telling of their experiences that are unique from every other guest. Several of the sessions that have been uh, recorded have been sent to the Library of Congress and the Army Heritage Foundation, I'm sorry. Hopefully this town resource will continue to build and have the conversations available to our schools and to our libraries. Everything that's been recorded so far has indeed been a Hopkinton treasure. And speaking of treasures, today we have a Hopkinton original. Uh, he's pleased when he's referred to as a townie, 82 years of it. Aubrey Doyle, welcome to Veterans Remember, and thank you for sharing your story. You're welcome, Hank. Um, it seems like every young man from Hopkinton, sometime or another, shows up in a military uniform. Uh, maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about your youth and how you grew into being in the military. Well, I was born on Elm Street, lived there until I was 19, and then I went off to college. And then right after that, I went to the military. And then I came back. Mm -hmm. But I, I suspect there was a lot between when you grew up and went into the military. The stories I've heard about you uh, are unending. You, uh, my, my, my background uh, enjoys knowing that you milked some cows before you went to school. Oh, yes. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. Twice a day, I bet. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. When you get home from, in the afternoon from football practice, you'd go out and milk again. Yeah. <clears throat> well, in my young life, uh, the fellows who worked on the farms always were very good arm wrestlers because of that hand milking that you did. And I bet you were one, too. Yeah, I was pretty good at it. <laughs> he says modestly. <laughs> and the push-ups on the football team. Tell us about, because athletics were such a, a big part of your life, uh, tell us a little bit about that early portion. Well, I started playing baseball when I was in the seventh grade. I was on the team. I didn't play much, but I went to the games. And in the eighth grade, I played basketball and baseball again just played on the JVs but I played in the ninth grade I played baseball and basketball mm -hmm. then in the tenth grade I started playing football and I made the varsity my first year and st started each year from then on mm -hmm. played started in basketball as a sophomore and baseball too so mm -hmm. I was pretty busy yeah, I bet you were I bet. and those years uh, also Hopkinton had such a limited population compared to today there wasn't a lot of organized playing. 
You, no, you just played in the high school. Mm -hmm. That was it. There was nothing else. Oh, well, St. John's had a team that was basketball team, yeah, which was older guys, but we, mm -hmm. we played on the JVs a lot for them. Mm -hmm. Played Tuesdays and Fridays for the high school and Sundays for the St. John's. Mm -hmm. So you get into a little, ba a little extra basketball. Sure. Who, who were some of the peers in your Hopkinton life that played with you on those sports? Well, there was Mike McBride and Ted Hunt, Davey Whalen, Davey Cross, Bird Cahill, <laughs> Barney Doherty, all kinds of names, J Jug Lowell, Bill Stickney, Don Melvin. Before we leave the sports, were you ever a stone thrower? No. I had a chance to, but I was going at college at the time. I didn't want to get hurt playing on the stone thrower, so I didn't play with them. So, uh, playing sports uh, helped getting into college? Well, yeah. The football coach from Brown came up and interviewed me, and so I went down and got mm -hmm. accepted. Mm -hmm. And, and how did you uh, do there? Were you on all three? Were no, just I was just football? On, on the football. I played freshman basketball, but I played football for four years. But I didn't. I wasn't a star or anything. I didn't play much. Mm -hmm. Just on the team. Yeah. But I graduated, so. Mm -hmm. Then when I went, <coughs> when I went in the service, I played in there, football there, in mm -hmm. Fort Dix, and then at Camp Zama. Mm -hmm. Camp Zama, Art Hunter and Mike Takas were on the team. They were, Art Hunter played for the Browns and Takas played for the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. <laughs> were the, there any uh, named football players at Dix as well? Uh, not Dix. Uh, yeah, it's what Dix. That's uh, right. That's that's right I guess play. you did play football there. Uh, well, it was Moose Marusi from Framingham and, and Gabby Gabinelli from, from Dartmouth. That's the only ones I can really think of. Well, you've got quite a memory to mem remember all of those. Uh, what, what did you do now that you're in the Army? What was your training? How did you blossom? I went to clerk type at school and then I went to New York City for two weeks to tr become an IBM typist. Punch, punch the numbers into the car, IBM cards. I see. That was the best duty I ever had. Went, work, went from four to nine, went to school, then we went, went off for the rest of the night, could do what we wanted. And I just had to get to the boat, at, to get back to Fort J, we had to get to the boat by three to get back because we didn't have any duties at Fort J. We just slept there. Oh. And ate there. No duties. We just so So that was your two year a uh, two week yeah. sojourn. Yeah, I went to uh, the game that the All Star game the chairman set set the record for foul shots. We were at the, that game. I went to a few hockey games and lots of things. Wow. Even in the military sports has a front <laughs> a front. Well row. this had nothing to do with sports. This was just we good duty. Yeah. Well, you're going to tell me that New York is a good sports town now. Well, New York's a great town for a weekend or a week or something. <laughs> I don't want to live there, but it's great, great to go once in a while. Yeah. Well, tell us uh, about uh, your clerk typist MOS. What are the kinds of things that, that led you to do? Uh, what? What did being a clerk typist cause you to do? I, I, oh. I assume you're not taking uh, dictation from the colonel. No, no. But I, I worked the 11 to 7 shift at Fort McPherson when I got transferred down there. And when I began, I just typed the, car, uh, the cards and sent them out to the machine room. Mm -hmm. And then they took me out of there and put me working on the, one of the machines and sorted them and printed them and whatever had to be done. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of the viewers, I assume, are going to be young enough to not know what this card is. <laughs> Could you tell a little bit about what Herman Hollerith did to us? Well, he put a card with all the numbers down there, and we'd type the number in, and the, each number would be for a letter or for a number, depending on what section of the card it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd type in what you had to, and then it'd come out, and they'd put it on a printer and print the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. So these cards were replacing what ordinarily would have been many pages right. of data? Yep. Yeah. And, and take us to that 
place where you had all the machinery. You were in the M R M R U M R U Machine yeah. Records Unit. Yeah. And what what was that environment like? Just a big open space with all kinds of machines and people running them. Hmm. And the machines are are taking this code from the typist? No. They you put the CADs in the machine, just put them in, and they would be, first you'd have to sort them by alphabet or whatever, whatever, whatever they wanted it sorted as by number, or, mm -hmm. and then you'd get them all sorted, then you'd give them to somebody else, and they, they would print them or take some of them out or whatever they had to do with that. Mm -hmm. And then finally they'd come up with a big sheet with all the all the names and numbers and whatever they wanted on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it was at the time, if, if I could guess, it was quite a technological change. We were going from typed pages, and now we have the computers, but these Hollerith cards were that transition point. And I think they had a, a good man with all your uh, mathematics uh, and technical background to be put into this big shift. And I, I don't know at the time whether you felt you were in a, in a technological change. No, I just felt I was doing something. Yeah. Wait, waiting for uh, practice to start. <laughs> well, at Fort McPherson, I worked the 11 to 7 shift, so we played softball in the evening, but didn't get any time off for that. Well, that's a shame. I know. <laughs> But, uh, but in basic training, I got time off to mm -hmm. play football. Mm -hmm. Oh, and down at Fort McPherson, I played basketball against Norm Seabird of the Yankees. Wow. He was on the baseball team down there, and yeah. Vinegar Ben Mizell was on it, too. Mm -hmm. Vinegar Ben, <laughs> I think he was, he was a sergeant. He <laughs> worked in the office where he took pieces of <laughs> paper and delivered it from one desk to another. <laughs> That's what he did. Well, th that meant he probably was first string on the ball team. Oh, yeah, he was the number one pitcher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was uh, Fort McPherson? Uh, Third, what? Third Army Headquarters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were they you know, important in any way? They had the best baseball team around. <laughs> <laughs> Aubrey. <laughs> this is Veterans Remember. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, that's great. what they had. That was just their army headquarters there. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but something else, it, it's in my mind, something else happened at Fort McPherson. Well, I met my wife down there. Ah. May, maybe you can talk of that as much as Vinegar Ben Mizell. Well, we, a friend of mine, well, the guy that I worked with said, uh, we, I got a date for you. My girlfriend has found something she li thinks you would like. I said, fine. So we went out and kept going. <laughs> Been together, what, 58 years now? Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah. And she's uh, from generally up here, isn't she? She's from Glens Falls, New York. Glens Falls. Then she moved to Avon Park, Florida, her father. Worked for the city of Glens Falls, and the mayor got got uh, not elected, so he was out of a job. Uh -huh. So he went to Florida, and then they went to Atlanta. Oh, and I she didn't was, realize she was in the fourth there. grade. Mm. And uh, her father worked for the city of Atlanta in the planning mm. department. He was an RPI engineer. Mm. So I met her, and we got married, and had six kids, and. Seven kids and <laughs> yeah. the rest is history. As the rest they say. is history. Yeah. Uh, you didn't stay at McPherson for your entire tour. No. I went to Camp Zama, Japan, in mm -hmm. in October of 1955. Mm -hmm. And did you choose Zama? Oh no, no, I didn't choose at all. I got just just got got sent there. I had no desire to go. I was oh, perfectly dear. happy in, in McPherson, but it wasn't to be, so I yeah. went. And, and how did Zama compare with McPherson? What was its role in the Army? Same thing. Same. Just same 
machines and so forth. Mm -hmm. Just everything around it was Japanese. Mm -hmm. You'd walk down the, if you go off the base, you walk down the street and you'd see the, the water running down the side of the <laughs> street. And it wasn't pretty water. <laughs> now that, that brings up a thought I should have asked you earlier. Uh, you entered the service, drafted into the service, in August of 54. Right. And that was 13 months or so after the Korean War ended. And typically, after big conflicts like that, we as a country reduce our armed forces. And so you got caught up into a, uh, a negative draft of sorts. I guess. They were still drafting, and they drafted us. Yeah. You didn't get any sense that there were fewer people in the service? No, but I didn't, didn't know how many people were in the service anyway. So. Yeah. And, I don't know, that, that's strange that you uh, got drafted at that time. Not that you got, got drafted. But, yeah. Well, they waited four years for me to go to college, so mm -hmm. I suppose. They well, just, they could, just, maybe they put you on a list and said, all right, now he's out, let's yeah. get him. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Japan was uh, not, not your first choice, and it sounds like it no. wasn't your choice at all. No, yeah. but it's where I went. Yeah. Um, did you work with uh, Japanese when you were on duty? They changed the light bulbs and stuff like that, but that's all they did. Mm -hmm. they, and they worked in the kitchen and that, but, mm -hmm. and they took care of all our equipment. And oh, good. Did yeah. all the cleaning and cleaned mm -hmm. the barracks and so forth. We paid, I forget, $10 a month or something. And why did you come home? That sounds yeah. like a deal. Yeah. Yeah, I was ready to come home. Yeah. And, and when did you come home? I got out August 4th, 1956. And when you came home from Zama, you went right home, you didn't have any No, I, went to, I had to go to Dix to get processed out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Took, a, took the train from Oakland, California to Fort Dix. Took us three days to get across the country. Wow. So, but then we, that was it. Yeah. I, and, and anything? Uh, to do at Dix anything military-wise or just waiting to get... Just waiting. We had, well, I worked in an office somewhere just sorting papers just to, so I wouldn't have to do KP. <laughs> <laughs> got out on a Saturday morning, got a ride to up in 140 in Princeton or somewhere up there. My father and mother come up and pick me up and that was it. I was done. Yeah, I'm sure you did a good job. When, when you came home, what was uh, on your schedule then? Getting married. Getting married. Got married the 18th of August, two weeks after I got out. Wow. So that was even ahead of playing ball. Oh, yeah. Well, that, was, that was good. I, I was all done playing ball by that time. That was good. That's good. And when, when that happened, you immediately got into teaching? Yeah, I, I had the job when I came home from the service. Mm -hmm. While I was in Japan, I got hired here in Hopkins. Oh. Well, it seems like you, you know, I, I haven't been here all those years, but it seems like you were a teacher forever. 38 years. 38 years. Yeah. Right from the get-go, never another job, just right into teaching. Oh. Yeah. And were there some interesting stories from probably your coaching, not your teaching? Oh, there's all kinds of stories from both. From both. <laughs> well, did uh, in in your teaching or coaching, did you have uh, any young people that themselves served in the military? Uh, yeah. No, a lot of them served in the military, mm -hmm. especially in the early days. Yeah. Russell Ellsworth was in the military. Paul Sheehan lost a leg in Vietnam. Right. Jimmy Laputri lost a bottom of his foot in Vietnam. I didn't know that. I don't know that name. No, oh, well, he, died. he lives in Florida now. Mm -hmm. But uh, Barney Hughes was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so even not in the service, you had an influence over people. Well, I don't know, coaching more or teaching more that you, would you say? Probably teaching more. Teaching. I only coached for 15 years. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I, I thought, uh, well, I, I don't know that I thought that, but didn't Dick Gooding play on some of your teams? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Played, well, Ed Hayes was the head coach when he was there. Oh. But, but I was the assistant. Mm -hmm. He and Dave Hughes and Freddie Harris all played. Mm -hmm. Well, then Dave coached for 30 years up here. Right. And Freddie Harris is now head of the, uh, well, whatever the company in Connecticut is that makes the submarines and boats. Oh, electric boat? Electric boat. He's head, he heads the San Diego uh, mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Electric boat. Yeah. And did uh, any of your uh, students or athletes go to Brown? Uh, no, not many. Dick Gooding got accepted, but he went to West Point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'd think that you were a, a, an exceptionally good plant here in Hopkins. Oh, I tried. You, you tried? Didn't get. It's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Susie Donovan went from. But she was a good field hockey player. Oh. So there are some sports related to going to Brown as well. From, Well, the thing that, uh, one of the things that uh, strikes me is that uh, here you are, a draftee, not particularly inclined to go to the military, yet when you look back and try to capsulate your life, you've got so many things in your life that crisscross the military. I mean, you were strong in athletics, and you played at Fort Dix. Uh, strong in athletics, and you played at McPherson with professionals, with literally professionals. You, you were an educator in technical areas, math, algebra, calculus, and you were placed in a role of technological change. And I think that's uh, significant. And you taught and coached. Uh, many young Hopkintonians that ended up in the service. And I think that's kind of a, a unique set of uh, dynamics, if you will. Uh, but I, at the time, I wonder if you even thought of it that way. No, I did. Yeah. I just hoped to do the best I could for them. Yeah. Well, some of those names I do recognize, and you certainly did do well with them. Is there anything that you can think of in the last couple of minutes uh, that relate to young people in Hopkinton and the military in, as we look in the future? Well, they're going to have to be quite smart now to, get, to do it in the military because they're going to have to use the computers and whatever else is available, where in my day, you, if you went in and you, you didn't have any skills, you could go in the infantry. Yeah. <laughs> Today, they don't, uh, well, they still have the infantry, but they don't have, they still have plenty of things they have to do to, right. so they have to be more skilled. But yeah, I'm, I'm surprised in talking with Dick Gooding that there, there are people today that literally choose the uh, infantry. Yeah. yeah. God bless them. I'm glad they're on our side. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and is there any benefits that you see from going in the service these days? Well, for some, yes. For others, no. For people that can't figure out what they want to do and mm -hmm. have trouble being, doing what they're told, mm -hmm. the military is good for them. But others, if they know what they want, I don't see them any reason to go in the military. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to today. They don't get drafted. Right. 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 But there's always the uh, scholarships, not the scholarship, but the but, tuition paid. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, some some do that, and it's mm -hmm. good for them. They they get a. I know a boy from Nipmuc that went up. He went to Worcester State, I think, but he was in a on an Air Force ROTCs mm -hmm. in the service now. He's 
got his diploma and now he's in the service in four years or something, so mm -hmm. it did him well. And we've had uh, 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 Bill McRoberts' son, he, Jeff, Jeff he, he spent 20 years flying. Yeah. Well, I don't know if he flew the whole 20 years. Well, he flew it. He flew hel helicopters first and then, yeah. then planes. Now he's flying for Delta. Oh, he is? Oh, yeah. yeah good for him. Yeah. yeah. Well, th that is uh, certainly a good, wholesome story of the military from a, a true Hopkinton treasure. Uh, if anyone out there can think of another interesting guest that veterans remember can benefit by, please call HCAM or myself. Thank you for watching, and Aubrey, thank you for being with us. You're welcome, Hank. I'm Cheryl Peralt, co-producer of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, an HCAM series honoring poetry, story, and song that takes place on the third Saturday each month before a live audience. Guest features share their art followed by an open mic with people who come from near and far. Others come to listen and be part of this warm and welcoming studio and to wake up a bit to arts and to life. You're welcome to join us and to tune in or visit our website for our weekly program. Hope you can join us. Yes, we're HCAM TV, but movies also? Dive In Drive In is a new program featuring the HCAM staff's favorite B-movies. Check our schedule at HCAM.TV for the next showing of some of the more forgotten films. Black and white or color, join Mike Terosian and myself as we introduce and give you some interesting facts about the cast and crews of classic movies. We hope you'll enjoy these treasured films of yesteryear.